Well, Anglo-Israelism, I suppose everybody's heard about it, sometimes called British Israelism, and it's one of the major teachings of the Armstrong cult. And we find a lot of misuse of scripture. The uh, teaching is that Britain and the United States constitute the ten lost tribes of Israel. Now, I drew here Palestine. We did have a map up here. You have to have an understanding, a little bit of an understanding of what is meant by the ten lost tribes before you can understand really the error in this teaching. And uh, it wasn't invented by Armstrong, but he has picked it up and popularized it, uh, especially in the United States and in other parts of the world. But there were 12 tribes of Israel, as you can see, and uh, Simeon, Judah, Dan, Benjamin, Ephraim, Manasseh, Issachar, Zebulun, Asher, Naphtali. Now you've got two named Manasseh, but Na Manasseh was so big, such a big tribe, that there was half on each side of the Jordan River. By the way, that's the Jordan and the Dead Sea, and it really is that crooked. If you see it from the air, as uh, we have. And that's the lake of Sea of Galilee up here, and that's a little lake, Lake Huli. And uh, uh, just from Sunday school or other teachings, you would have gotten that the fact that the kingdoms divided uh, right after the death of Solomon, divided, and ten tribes came to be called Israel as such. Before that, all twelve tribes were known as the nation of Israel, of course. And when they divided, and no point in going into the details of that, I'm sure you understand that from uh, just reading the Bible. Ten of the tribes went with the north and two stayed with the south. That is, Judah and the little tribe of Benjamin were always considered really one tribe. But that makes up the twelve. Now, in 722 B.C., the Assyrians came into Palestine and conquered it, all except Judah and Benjamin, and took all the ten tribes of Israel, known as Israel, captive into Assyria. That was in 722 B.C., uh, 722 years before Christ. Then, uh, over a hundred years later, Nebuchadnezzar from Babylonia came in 586 B.C., that's before Christ, and took the last remaining tribes, Judah and Benjamin, captive to Babylonia. Now, Armstrong contends that these ten tribes never did return to their land and cites certain scriptures which he, whereby he tries to prove that. Uh, and as we know from history and scripture, after 70 years captivity in Babylonia, Judah and Benjamin, that is the southern kingdom, did return. Jeremiah had prophesied that they'd be in captivity for 70 years, which they were. And uh, Daniel and Ezekiel uh, are prophesying Jeremiah all about the same time. Now, the theory of Armstrong is that the ten tribes are lost to history. And I'm going to show you tonight from the Word of God. They've never been lost, and we know where they are as far as their return. And that he is building a false theory, <clears throat> false hope, upon some misapplied scriptures. The theory is that the ten tribes <clears throat> who were carried captive into Assyria in 722 B.C. never returned. And they migrated across Europe and uh, became what today is England and the United States, that the ten lost tribes of Israel are really uh, uh, Britain and the United States, uh, that she never, the ten tribes never returned to their land. Now, we don't even have to raise the question of how could we be, all of us, Jewish and that sort of thing, Semitic when... Our whole background, uh, uh, biologically and genetically and everything else, obviously as I look at you, most of you are not Jews, but uh, <clears throat> we won't go into all of that. Uh, and so <clears throat> the ten tribes ultimately migrated across Europe, see up from Assyria, if you go straight up, you'll hit Europe and over, and uh, became the ancestors of the Saxons. S-A-X-O-N-S, Saxons, and of course you know the English uh, are called Anglo-Saxons. And of course we, uh, most of us, came uh, uh, from that background. And so <clears throat> according to this theory, Judah represents the Jews. 
And the ten tribes known as Israel, after they divided into two kingdoms, uh, were called Israelites. And Judah is, of course, the one, the tribe through whom the Messiah was to come, Jesus. So Judah was the uh, kingdom of David, and uh, he sat upon the throne. And then Christ came through the line of Judah. Now, as I say, we've studied all this, like the book of Hebrews, chapter 7 tells us his lineage and so forth, Romans 1. And that Judah, because it rejected the Messiah, the ten tribes, Armstrong says, didn't reject the Messiah because they weren't even there. They never did return from eight centuries before Christ. They went on into Europe and became the Saxons. Uh, but Judah, because she rejected Jesus, has been rejected by God, and therefore all the promises made to Israel do not go to Judah, as the Bible over and over says they do, by the way, that this is the chosen tribe out of the twelve through whom the Messiah would come. But Armstrong contends all the promises go to Israel, that is England and the United States, since we are the Israelites. And that after the division into uh, a northern kingdom, Israel, and a southern kingdom, Judah, and there were two kingdoms for many years, uh, never again were they ever united. And in Scripture, from that time on, you'll never find them united. And God has rejected Judah forever, and Israel is the heir to the promises. Now, these are really the names of 12 sons, Simeon, Judah, and so forth, the 12 sons of Jacob. And uh, since Joseph and Levi are not in here, you know, one of Jacob's sons was named Joseph, and another was named Levi. And uh, Joseph had two sons, one named Ephraim and one named Manasseh. And since Levi has no inheritance in Israel, God is their inheritance, they are the priesthood, uh, then they were given no land except, uh, I mean, as far as uh, an inheritance. And uh, since Joseph uh, is not named as a tribe, then for Levi and Joseph you have Manasseh and Ephraim both of those being in the northern kingdom of Israel. And often in the Old Testament, you'll find God calling Israel Ephraim, sometimes Manasseh, but usually Ephraim. It's just a symbolic name for Israel. And of course, Israel was Jacob's name. You remember Jacob was renamed, and, uh, and uh, the nation took his name, Israel, after he wrestled with the angel. And that's what Israel means in Hebrew. It means he prevailed with God. And... Uh, so Armstrong contends that uh, they are Manasseh and we are Ephraim. Uh, these, uh, we are the select tribes. Uh, see, the other, other eight tribes have applications in other parts of the world, but uh, we are the chosen Israelites of God, Manasseh and Ephraim. And that the Queen of England now sits upon the throne of David since 2 Samuel 7, 13 says that uh, that uh, David's throne will never, never lack anyone upon it. And so the Queen of England, though obviously not Jewish, nevertheless is the Queen of Israel. And we're Israel. Now, Armstrong contends, I don't have a European map here, and so uh, it isn't going to help. You just have to use your imagination. But as the ten lost tribes, they're supposed to be lost, and he found them, you see, uh, as they migrated across Europe, they left certain landmarks uh, and uh, certain names of towns and rivers and that sort of thing show you the ten tribes crossed, like Danzig and the Danube River. <laughs> he gets that, he says that proves that the tribe of Dan uh, uh, crossed Europe. Now, if you don't know anything about the Bible, why, that sounds a little attractive, you know, that... Uh, we are the ancestors of all of God's, uh, of the Israelites and the inheritors of all of God's promises made to the Jews and made to Israel. And, uh, and he weaves all sorts of fantastic theories. For example, you take Isaac, Armstrong says, and drop the I because the Hebrews did not use vowels. Just let me demonstrate for a moment and then I'll tell you what Armstrong said. Now here is the Hebrew word for Adam writing in Hebrew. You notice you write it backwards. 
see, that's, uh, and there are no vowels there. Those are all consonants, you see. And it, the vowels were added later to help people who uh, couldn't read just consonants, and those are the two vowels, and that's pronounced Adam. Hey, you got your Jewish T-shirt on? Yeah. <laughs> see there, there, there's nothing but consonants, no vowels. And that says, <laughs> that says uh, Joshua in Hebrew. See, that's a Y and an H and a W and a SH and uh, kind of a breathing mark on the last. <laughs> now, the Hebrews do not use vowels. And his T-shirt, uh, you see, says um, Joshua on it, but there are no vowels at all. It's like spelling cat C-T. Now, if you wonder if that makes it a little difficult to read Hebrew, yes, it does. <laughs> That's why generally students, I used to teach it in the seminary, uh, students only take one course. You know, that's required. After that, they forget it. In fact, after I took my first, first course, Greek looked easy. I said, that's all of Hebrew. And then the Lord ended up, uh, had me ending up majoring in Old Testament and uh, Hebrew. And I ended up teaching it. But um, yes, it's very difficult because imagine all your English words with no, with no vowels in them, just the consonants. All right, on that basis, then, see, this, the, the vowels would be out. All you get, if, if you write son in Hebrew, uh, you just get a B-N. You don't get the vowel. Of course, uh, actually, the vowel is B-E-N, Ben. That's, that's son in Hebrew. So uh, Armstrong says, if you drop the I from Isaac, look what you end with, sack. And then if you add the word son to that, you end up with sack son. Spelled, to, well now listen, he's got books on this. Our Saxon, which of course, who are they? The British. <laughs> well, don't run it for the rest of them uh, by uh, moaning and groaning because you see through it, but uh, uh, there's just there are millions of people deluded by this uh, argument, and uh, then he says too, uh, you take the Hebrew word for covenant. Uh, I'll write it in English. I mean, he has books on this. This is one of the major doctrines: the British Israelism, that the British is, are Israel, the Israelites are Anglo-Israelism. Same thing. If you take the Hebrew word for covenant. And since Hebrew didn't use vowels, we drop the E, but he doesn't bother to follow consistency. He also takes the H off, and they didn't drop the consonants, you see. And so you'll end up, you're ahead of us, Brit. And he says, if you add the Hebrew word for man, which is ish, look at that. The British. Which, since this means covenant and ish is man, then he says the British are the men of the covenant, the inheritors of the promises made to Israel. Well, friends, there are a lot of gullible people uh, that uh, don't even know English well, let alone Greek and Hebrew and all of this, and it sounds quite convincing. Well, what can we answer to such a scholarly argument? from someone who must be a Hebrew scholar. First of all, there is about as much relationship between Hebrew and the Anglo-Saxon languages that you would find in English or America uh, as between Hebrew and Chinese. There's absolutely no relationship between. You, can't, you cannot take a Hebrew word like Isaac and, uh, and start dropping vowels. And by the way, you notice he keeps two vowels. If you, drop, if you drop from this word what he said to do, you end up with SC. And I don't know what that means unless it's South Carolina instead of this. <laughs> that wouldn't be Britain any way you look at it. Well, we're way up out of it. But you see, they, he keeps the A's. He's no consistency. But there's no relationship at all between a Semitic tongue, Hebrew, and Aramaic, and those tongues, and any Anglo-Saxon language. They are so different, there's no relationship, no comparison. And there's only one word in all of my years of Hebrew, and I, I, I got so I knew it pretty well. There's only one word that even sounded like in English, and that's because we get one word, and I discovered only one, 
that came out of Hebrew, and that's cinnamon. And Hebrew is kinnamon, kinnamon. And that's pretty close to cinnamon. But other than that, there's no relationship. We just simply lifted a word out of the Hebrew and made something out of it. And, uh, and, and here's another thing. Now this, you don't have to remember the arguments except, uh, I mean, all of the technicalities, but to remember that uh, some of the things, like there's no relationship between Hebrew and English. Uh, if, you, if you write... If you write this in Hebrew, I'm going to write it for you just to show you something. Now that's, that's, this is in Hebrew. What he says, you take, this is the word for covenant. That's B-E-R-I-T-H, C-B-E-R-I-T-H. And then the word for man, I-S-H. Now, I'm just telling you this to show you that Armstrong, if he'd, know, if he'd known Hebrew, he wouldn't make such blunders. There's absolutely no way that you can make this mean uh, man of the covenant. You see, he says that if you drop these, this, the E and the H and add the word for ish, you end up with Brit-ish, and in Hebrew that would be covenant man. He says that means man of the covenant, or the British are the men of the covenant, to whom God made the covenant, you see. But you see, the only problem is writing British in Hebrew, when you put two nouns together, you can never end up with man of the covenant. It's utterly impossible. Because when two nouns come together in Hebrew, it always, in this case, would mean a covenant of man. Just the opposite to what he's trying to teach, that it's a covenant of God made to the British. But this means in Hebrew, the way he's showing it, a covenant of man, you see, a man-made covenant. And uh, if he, as I said, if he'd just known a little Hebrew, uh, just first semester Hebrew, he'd never make that blunder. Because when two nouns, and covenant and man are two nouns, when they come together in Hebrew without exception, absolutely no exceptions, it's always what you call a genitive relationship. You use the word of. Somebody's lost. Uh, and it has to mean a covenant of man. And he's trying to prove it's a covenant of God made to the British. Now, more than that, and it's almost laughable, uh, you see, uh, when the pen starts, stops working, I start misspelling. All right. It's impossible. Well, let me say, first of all, he arbitrarily, you notice, drops vowels and, uh, just to fit his theory. Why didn't he drop the I here? You see, if he's going to say the Hebrew drops vowels and Hebrew doesn't drop them, they just don't have them. Uh, they just knew how to read the consonants. They knew what the word meant by looking at it. And, of course, it was not a very uh, complex language in the sense that it wasn't a wide vocabulary. No words for airplane typewriter and all that. Uh, very picturesque language. They didn't need a lot of words. Greek, Greek has a tremendously big vocabulary. But because the Hebrew didn't write with any vowels, uh, there's just a limitation to how many words he could put together and know what they meant. And so what's really laughable about this is if, if he had known just a little Hebrew, anyone knowledgeable of Hebrew knows most of the words translated into English from the Hebrew as well as the Greek are very poor translations. Uh, it's almost pathetic. I had somebody tell me once that they thought Isaiah, Elias, rather, Elias was another prophet. When I told them it was Elijah, they didn't know that was Elijah. See, that's a poor translation of uh, Eli Yah, uh, which is Elijah. Uh, and uh, in the New Testament, it comes out Elias. Did you know that's Elijah? Well, anyway, most of your words, most of your names are very poor translation. And, and, and in the Hebrew, you don't start Isaac with a consonant, but with a, I mean, with a vowel that he wants to drop to get sack and then son out of it, you know. Uh, it starts with a Y, a consonant. And uh, in Hebrew, here's, here's Isaac in Hebrew. Yitzchak. It doesn't even sound like Isaac. They never translated uh, like uh, Solomon is not Solomon. It's Shlomo. Like uh, 
When we were over in Israel, the Gordon Lindsay, Christ for the Nations missionary and his wife over there, his name is Solomon Chizak. Uh, Isaac. Everybody calls him Solomon Isaac, but he doesn't call himself that. He calls himself Shlomo Isaac. Uh, but uh, it's Yitzchak in Hebrew. If anybody needs to know what it looks like, so you remember. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I defy Armstrong or anybody else to get sack out of Yitzchak. You see, if Isaac were a transliteration of the Hebrew, which it isn't, and then you arbitrarily drop the I, yes, you end up with sack, and uh, if you add son, and you have to dream up what you want to add, you end up with sack son, and then you have to change the spelling to S-A-X-S-O-N, you see, sack son, which are the British, and so on. But the point is that Isaac isn't even spelled the way Armstrong is taking it out of the English. It's spelled not with a, with a vowel, but with a consonant, and it ends up Yitzchak. And how are you going to get you nowhere know, in the world? I wonder what he did. See, you can't drop that vowel, that consonant, because he's dropping a vowel. Well, it pays, as I say, to know a little bit about the Greek and the Hebrew, because there are a lot of false teachers and false prophets, prophets running around uh, teaching things, uh, trying to impress people with their knowledge of the languages that they don't have. But there's absolutely no basis for Anglo-Israelism in Scripture anyway, uh, because although they were formally divided into two nations after Solomon's death, uh, nevertheless the Scriptures speak of them as one nation again after the exile, over and over as one nation. And besides that, uh, God says one day that he's going to reunite Israel and Judah as one people. And that's a very interesting passage I'd like to read. Ezekiel 37, uh, not only is Israel and Judah spoken of again as one nation, and Armstrong says they never are, that God's done with Judah. He only speaks of Israel. Not only are they spoken of as one nation in Ezekiel 37, but one day God's going to make it a permanent reality. Uh, Ezekiel 37, we might begin reading at verse 15. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Moreover, thou son of man, <clears throat> take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions, and take another stick and write upon it for Joseph. Now see, Joseph would mean Israel there. Since Joseph's two sons... Ephraim, Manasseh became the two northern, two of the northern tribes in Israel. So God interchange through, throughout Scripture interchangeably you have Joseph, Ephraim, Manasseh, Israel, all meaning the same thing. So he tells the prophet to take one stick and write it on it for Judah, take another stick and write on it for Israel, or Joseph, meaning that, uh, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel his companions, and join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. Now you don't need any interpretation on the fact that the kingdoms are divided while Ezekiel is prophesying, but one day they're going to be united again. And that's what he's symbolically to act out here by uh, writing on the stick, one stick, Judah, on another Israel, and then people ask him what this means, and then he prophesies and teaches them. And so when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not show us what thou meanest by these, by these two sticks? Say then unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, that means Israel, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his fellows, and will put them with him, even the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in mine hand. And the sticks where it, where on thou writest shall be in thine hand before their eyes. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they are gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all, and they shall no more be two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. And I couldn't be any plainer than that that Armstrong teaches that God's done with Judah, they rejected Christ, and from, the, from then on he speaks only of Israel uh, with respect to uh, the promises and that 
Uh, we are the Israelites, England and America uh, are the ten lost tribes, and uh, they, they're not, of course, he would not say we are Jews. He'd say, of course, that over the centuries we've intermarried uh, with other nations and uh, uh, bloods, and therefore, uh, while we are not literally Jews, we inherit those promises because our ancestors were the ten tribes and uh, became, of course, the ancestors of the Saxons who went into England, and England and her colonial empire became, uh, became Israel. Now, uh, in view of the fact that he stresses over and over that they are never, Israel and Judah are never mentioned as one kingdom again, I don't know what he does with Ezekiel 37 and similar passages, of course. But I found in the false cult teachings that, that if one knows just a little bit about the Bible, you can see the Spirit of God will show you. You can see where they're missing it because it'll always be out of harmony with the overall teaching of the Word of God. You can prove a lot of things by a verse or a passage. But remember, Peter said, they rest the Scriptures, those who are this way, uh, to deceive the people. They rest the Scriptures to their own destruction. Now, not only that, but the Bible speaks of the Jews and Israel uh, interchangeably, it uses the terms, they're synonymous terms. That is to say, Armstrong says that no Israelite is ever called a Jew after the division of the empire. That Jews are people from Judah, and Israelites are people from the northern kingdom, those ten tribes, lost tribes that became Britain and the United States. Uh, but over and over again in Scripture, after the uh, division, both Israelites are called Jews, and Jews are called Israelites. And so if you just read the Word, uh, you'd find that uh, such teaching doesn't hold up. Like in Acts uh, 21.39, for example. This is way over in the New Testament. He says, never again is a Jew called an Israelite after the division of the king, uh, or an Israelite a Jew, because God is done with the Jews, and all the promises go to the Israelites, the ten lost tribes. But I'm saying to you that all 12 tribes are called Jews and all 12 tribes are called Israel in Scripture. Uh, in Acts uh, 21 and verse 39, But Paul said, I am a man which am a Jew. Now what did he call himself? A Jew. Now if you'll turn over to the book of Romans, look what he calls himself. Uh, Romans 11 In verse uh, 1, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite. Now which is it? <laughs> he said in Acts 21, 39, I'm a Jew. In Romans, he said, I'm an Israelite. Well, the fact is, he's both. Because uh, a Jew is not someone from Judah. A Jew is a child of Abraham. And... Uh, uh, I never, uh, I haven't bothered to look up the word for a long time, but uh, uh, the fact that one is a Jew uh, is, relates him to Abraham, and the fact that he's an Israelite means that he is uh, a child of Jacob. And of course you would be both. If you were, if you were a Jew, you'd be an Israelite and a Jew. Well, anyway, there uh, is an example of Philippians uh, 3 and verse 5 is another example that way over here in the New Testament, Contrary to what Armstrong teaches, Philippians 3 and I believe verse 5, that Jews and Israelites are interchangeable terms. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin. Now the point is that, uh, that uh, See, Judah and Benjamin were the two southern tribes that Armstrong says God is done with. Paul says, he says, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel from the tribe of Benjamin. In other words, Paul was from the tribe of Benjamin, which would be make him a Jew in Armstrong's theory. But he said of the stock of Israel. And so he's using, he's claiming to be a Jew and Israelite here in the same verse because Benjamin and Judah were the two, only two tribes of the southern kingdom, which uh, uh, Paul was from that. 
Now, not only that, but uh, it's evident Armstrong says the ten tribes did not return. They were lost, and he found them over in uh, Britain and the United States. But it's evident that all 12 tribes, representatives of all 12 tribes, came back from Assyria, came back from Babylonia into Palestine, and were one nation again after the two captivities were over. You see, the kingdom was divided. But Israel, the northern kingdom, was taken into captivity in 722, the southern kingdom taken into captivity in 586. But King Cyrus comes along, Ezra chapter 1, and says that God spoke to his heart. He was a pagan king, but he says, the God of heaven told me to restore you people to your land and to help you rebuild your temple. Uh, that's in Ezra chapter 1. <clears throat> and I want to read a couple of verses there. Now, the, the significance of that is that King Cyrus' kingdom, uh, this becomes Persia, you see. It becomes a Persian empire. First it was the Assyrian empire that conquered the world. Then the Babylonians conquered the world. Then the Persians conquered the Babylonians. And so King Cyrus, king of Persia, rules the whole known world of that day. And so over in Ezra chapter 1, here's what he says. Now remember he's king of uh, all of the... Uh, region in the Near East in those days. Verse 2 of Ezra 1, Then saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven, hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth. You see, he, he controls it all. The, the, as far as he knows, that's all there is. And he hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all of his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God, which is in Jerusalem. And whosoever remaineth in any place wherewith he sojourneth, let the men of his place help him with silver, gold, goods, beasts, besides the free will offering for the house of God that's in Jerusalem. The significance of what is said here in these couple of verses is that Cyrus is not only king of the old Babylonian Empire, but he's king of the Assyrian Empire. Persia is the whole world. Persia includes uh, all the way over into what is Rome, uh, what would be the Roman Empire later. And he said, wherever you dwell, any Jew anywhere, let him return to his land. And so that would not only be just not just Judah and Benjamin, but all of the other ten tribes, because they are still here. Of course, according to Armstrong, they migrated through Europe, but he doesn't know when they did it. And we can assume they're still there, because you see, Cyrus is uh, just uh, about 70 years. King Cyrus, when he issues this decree, it's in five, uh, 536. See, that's just 70 years later. So... Um, So the ten tribes wouldn't have migrated across Europe yet, even if you followed Armstrong's theory. But anyway, right here in Ezra, for example, we see names from people of the ten tribes of Israel that returned to, to Babylon. Now Ezra chapter 2 gives a list of the children of Israel who returned uh, from captivity. Remember, the whole theory of British Israelism stands or falls on whether or not the ten tribes went back to Palestine or whether they, as he said, migrated across Europe and became the Saxons. And in Ezra chapter 2 and verse uh, 28, look at this. The men of Bethel and Ai, 223. Now each verse tells you how many returned? In the first return, there were 50,000 men who returned from all the tribes. Armstrong contends only Judah and Benjamin returned. The ten tribes migrated into Europe at some time. But here are 223 men definitely said to be from Bethel and Ai. And Bethel was the religious capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. And Ai is up in the northern kingdom of Israel. In other words, both of these towns are in the northern kingdom. And so we're plainly told here that men from the ten tribes came back. Verse 70 gives some more. And uh, there are other passages in Scripture. Verse 70 of chapter 2. <clears throat> so the priests and the Levites and some of the people and the singers and the porters 
And the Nethanims dwelt in their cities and all Israel in their cities. Verse 70 tells you all Israel was dwelling in their cities. They must have come back to done that. Because he's distinguishing here between Levites and others. And all, all of Israel. Well, and then in uh, 1 Chronicles 9.3 is another passage that, prove that proves that Israelites returned. And not just people from Judah. 1 Chronicles 9.3. And in Jerusalem... And by the way, 1 Chronicles, if you'll read verse 1, tells you who returned from the Babylonian captivity. He's talking about those who returned. He gives the names of them. All right, in verse 3, in Jerusalem dwelt the children of Judah and the children of Benjamin. Now, it would been nice for you to stop there. That would prove Armstrong's theory. But then he says, and of the children of Ephraim and Manasseh, uh, the two sons of Joseph, two, the, the two major tribes. He says they dwelt, they came back. Verse 1, so all Israel was reckoned by genealogies, all Israel, and behold, they were written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah, who were carried away to Babylon for that transgression. And he shows here that Ephraim and Manasseh were, were included in those of Judah, and not, uh, that the kingdom was not really divided, because they were dwelling in Jerusalem. I mean, it was not completely divided. But uh, a passage uh, that's even clearer than that is Ezra, Ezra 6 and verse 17, which shows that all representatives of all 12 tribes certainly did return. And there's no way in the world to answer this, this verse. Armstrong is stuck with this one because he says the 10 tribes never did come back, <clears throat> only Judah and Benjamin. But in Ezra 6 <clears throat> and verse 17, we see them here offering sin offerings for all the tribes. And they offered at the dedication of the house of God a hundred bullocks, two hundred rams, four hundred lambs for a sin offering for all Israel. Twelve he goats according to the numbers of the tribe of Israel. If only two tribes come back, then what are they offering? Twelve sin offerings for all the tribes of Israel. You see, when they rebuilt the temple, then they dedicated it <clears throat> and offered sacrifices. <clears throat> One of the types of sacrifices they offered, which was always required, the high priest was to offer sin offerings for the whole, all of the people. So they didn't offer just one for the nation, but they offered 12 for each tribe. There'd been no need of doing that if the 10 tribes had been written off and only Judah and Benjamin returned. Well... Uh, there's just no basis at all, as I said, for uh, British Israelism or Anglo-Israelism or whatever uh, you want to call it. And I go into a little bit more detail in the book than I'm giving you. But uh, as I point out, the scriptures know nothing about ten lost tribes because they were never lost. I mean, they're just, uh, they've been found. And uh, way over in the New Testament... Uh, like in Acts 26, 7, the New Testament still speaks of the 12 tribes of Israel. Acts 26, 7. Now, if they're lost, then why are we confronted with statements like this? Unto which promise are 12 tribes instantly serving God day and night hope to come? See, he's giving... A testimony here before the king. Paul is defending his gospel. And he says the 12 tribes day and night are serving God waiting for the Messiah to come. He said all 12 were, not just Judah and Benjamin and 10 lost somewhere. But Paul himself says all 12 tribes instantly, that means uh, continually, are serving God day and night. Uh, for the hope, you know, of uh, is to come. Of course, they rejected him when he did come, but at least they were claiming to wait upon him. Then over in James uh, chapter 1 and verse 1, look to whom James writes his epistle. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scat scattered abroad. See, but this time all 12 tribes are dispersed, parts of them, <clears throat> But the point is, James writes his letter, and this is the first epistle in the New Testament. This is the oldest one in the New Testament. First one to ever be written before gospel or anything else was the little book of James. 
And uh, he addresses it to the 12 tribes of Israel throughout the world, wherever they'll read this epistle. He's still calling them 12 tribes, contrary to Armstrong's theory that uh, only the 10 tribes are called Israelites and the two, Judah and Benjamin, have been rejected by God. But uh, uh, even the New Testament there in two places speaks of the 12 tribes. Now, uh, the other idea from 2 Samuel uh, 7.13 that the throne of David has sitting upon it today the Queen of England because he says in 2 Samuel 7.13 that God promises that there will never be anyone, uh, the, never, it will, the throne of David will never lack someone sitting upon it. He establishes his kingdom forever. Actually, he doesn't say that. And I'd like for you to look at that or listen to it. 2 Samuel 12, he's speaking here to David through Nathan the prophet. Uh, God says, When thy days be fulfilled, speaking to David, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. Of course, he's speaking, you know, of Christ and his eternal kingdom. And he will build a house for my name, meaning the uh, church ultimately, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now that's a prophecy to David. David wanted to build a house, a temple, and God said, no, you're a man of war. And he used him that way. He wasn't criticizing him. But he said, the man who builds the temple will be a man of peace. And so he said, your son Solomon will build it, which he did. But this is a prophecy concerning Messiah, not just uh, speaking of Solomon. Uh, but anyway, God is promising here in verse 13 that he will establish the throne of David forever. So Armstrong says that means there must be a king ruling on it, or a queen, uh, uninterrupted, uh, uninterruptedly down through history. Well, the only problem with that, there has never been a king on the throne of David since the last king, Zedekiah, was taken into captivity in 586 B.C. Zedekiah was the last king of Judah. That's the last king that's ever, ever sat on a throne uh, in Israel, they have not even governed themselves, nor not even allowed. They were a conquered people until 1947 when they declared themselves a sovereign state and raised the flag of Israel and have been a nation, uh, sovereign nation since 1947. But from 586 till 1947, they have been under the rule of uh, Syrians, Babylonians, uh, Persians, Greeks, Romans, Assyrians before that, of course. Uh, and uh, down through history, their land has been held by the Turks and by the English and you name it. And so uh, it was not until 1947. And since Zedekiah fell and was taken captive in 586, there has not been a king on the throne. Now, where does he get the idea that uh, there has to be a king on the throne? And the promise here is that I will, when he says I'll establish his, the throne of his kingdom forever, he doesn't necessarily mean continuously there'll be someone sitting on the throne because there'll be no one on that throne until the king uh, to whom it belongs comes the Lord Jesus Christ and if Armstrong again knew the word and didn't twist scripture to fit his theories the scriptures themselves in Hosea chapter 3 plainly says that there will be no king on David's throne for a long time because of their rejection, you know, sin and all. There will be no king for a long time, and it couldn't be any plainer. And I think you ought to remember Hosea 3. It will help you in a lot of uh, Bible studies and understanding and theories that people propose. There will never be a king till Jesus comes and sits on it. And he didn't sit on it at his first advent. Uh, verse 4. Hosea 3 and verse 4, For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, and without a prince, and without a sacrifice, and without an image, and without an ephod, without a teraphim, false gods. Afterward, literally in the latter days, shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God, and David their king, and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. You see, he said they would be without a king for a long time. And he says when they return, they'll come back to David. Well, David's dead. But who's the David he's talking about? Christ. 
David was a type of Christ, of course. That's obvious to any uh, Christian that uh, all of uh, so much scripture speaks of David and Christ, uh, David being a type of Christ, Christ being a son of David according to the flesh, which he is. And they're going to seek David. And Jeremiah in one prophecy, I think chapter 23, says that David one day will sit on his throne and rule over Israel. Well, David's dead. And uh, Jeremiah was prophesying long after David had died. Well, isn't David resurrected, but it's Christ. Because if you read the next verse after he says David will sit on his throne, uh, Jeremiah says his name is the Lord. And so obviously David isn't the David that... Uh, just because the name is used. Of course, many, many, many terms like that in Scripture that symbolically represent someone else. And so, <clears throat> while God promised David an eternal throne, it doesn't mean that there will be a king on it continuously or without interruption. Because if I've said facts, you wouldn't have to know much biblical history Facts prove there's been no king since the 6th century before Christ, down to 1900. They still don't have a king, of course, but down to 1947, they were not even a people who could govern themselves. They were scattered throughout the world. Now they're a sovereign nation, but of course they do not have a um, they have prime minister and that sort of a government. But, uh, and they're not even looking for a kingship. And so they still don't have a king, and they won't until Jesus comes. Now, another thing that disproves the whole idea that God has rejected Judah, Paul says he's rejected Israel. Now, of course, Paul includes Judah, <clears throat> that he has temporarily set aside the whole nation of Israel. Uh, in Romans 11, he says, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Uh, it isn't just Judah who's rejected, but the whole nation of Israel because of their unbelief. Verse 25, I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel. Well, and according to his theory, they never use Israel with, rejection, uh, with respect to rejection and uh, adversity, but only Judah and the Jews. But, of course, in the Bible, they're the same thing. So Paul says, blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become, become, become in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come a deliverer out of Jerusalem, Zion, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Well, Jacob is Israel, you see. And, of course, according to Armstrong, uh, Israel are the covenant people, and uh, here they are rejected by God, temporarily set aside. Well, we could say finally that, uh, that in order to follow the theory of Anglo-Israelism, you'd have to reject the scores, scores of promises of the restoration of the Jews to their homeland. If Britain and the United States if we, with England, constitute the ten lost tribes, the descendants of the Israelites, and the inheritance, inheritors of the blessings of Israel, all the covenant promises come to us, then you would literally have to do away with a large part of your Bible because scores of times, over and over, whole passages, I'm talking about scores of times, uh, God promises to restore Israel to her land and restore her king to her and to save her. And according to British Israelism, that can't happen because we are the blessed people of God. And that's why we're so prosperous when the rest of the world, you know, is filled with strife. And not that we're perfect, he wouldn't say that, but that uh, we are the descendants and uh, those who inherit the promises made to Israel. But you'd have to ignore literally scores of promises and sometimes whole passages which promise the restoration of Israel. Uh, like the whole book of Zechariah, 14 chapters, the whole book you just have to throw out because from cover to cover, from the first verse to the last verse of 14 chapters, it promises one thing, the restoration of Israel uh, to her land with her king ruling in her land on the earth and that sort of thing. And so British Israelism is a, just a, a major teaching of uh, Armstrongism, but a false one. 
And we encourage you not to be deceived by it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, on that kind of a study, maybe somebody's got a question. Praise the Lord. Well, stand with us, son, and we'll uh, be dismissed. Father, we are grateful for the light that you've given unto your children in your word, which we feel is sufficient in this hour to be a lamp unto our feet and to guide us into all truth. And help each, each of your children, wherever they may be, in this end time to keep their eyes upon thy word, not upon the pet theories and teachings and doctrines and deceptions of men. So many who lie in wait to deceive those who are not grounded in the word and that uh, we must hold fast to the truth that Israel is a people called unto thee, elected by thee, and over and over have been prophesied, predicted, promised that they would be restored, just as we're seeing has happened today. And while you have saved us and given us a great calling in this end time, nevertheless, let us not uh, diminish one iota the place of Israel in your divine purpose in these last days. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. God bless you.